thought violins one more time. All right, so you can take a look at this one. Just beautiful job. You saw it in the last video if you watched the last video. This is a Carlo Lamberti master model made exclusively for Char instruments in a, in a shop, not a factory, in China under the watchful eye of a master violin maker, and I believe it. If you were to buy one new right now, I think they're going for $1,750. Oh, that's a, that's a lot of money for us mere mortals, let's face it. But there is another source of old historical violins at a, at a lower cost than that, with possibly really good tone, that's on eBay. But you have to be smart about it. If you go to eBay and do a search for old violins, there's some gems out there. Even um, eBay stores in, in Europe are selling these things. And you can pick up conceivably a very beautiful, wonderfully toned old violin for less than this, even if it has to be shipped from Germany. But you have to be smart about it. You have to be smart about it. First of all, there are some sites you have to increase your knowledge base. One of them is Verizio. That is a major instrument house. It has a lot of reference material available for anyone as long as you register. It'll go through, and one aspect of that I use is list of European violin makers from A to Z. And so say you, you go to you go to eBay and you find a violin and they'll say they're not gonna say for a hundred percent certainty that that label is right, but generally speaking the ones that are faked would be Stradivari, Guanari, you know, Guadagnini and these other big makers. An unknown name, probably not faked. Probably, but possibly. And so, Landolfi. Carlo Landolfi, for one. Um, go to Verizio. Violin Makers A to Z. Look up Landolfi, or anybody else. Hit the L, and it goes down through the, all the L's. Whoa. The highest price paid for a Landolfi violin I might be mispronouncing the name, I just pulled one out of the air, uh, was uh, Brompton's auction, for example, $15,865. Oh, and so these are regarded as decent violins. It's, it's not, say, in the league of six figures or seven figures, but, you know, if... Uh, this fellow had made violins and they sold for ten to fifteen thousand dollars. That's not too shabby, and I can get one for eight hundred dollars on eBay. Go to next site is important. Martin Swan, tone um, analysis or tone review or whatever it is. Martin Swan, and old Martin has had the opportunity to play a lot of instruments. Same deal. You go to L, see if Martin has tested. A Landolfi or several of them. Now this is not going to be for that one instrument on eBay, but you can get a pretty good judge of his tonal qualities. Generally speaking, you're not going to get a shabby maker that will have three stars out of three in tone for a violin. They'll probably be quite similar. Eh, I don't know if you're going to find on eBay for $600 a three-star violin from Martin Swan site, but you know if you get two that's pretty darn good. That is the bulk of really good instruments would be two stars. Um, match that up. Brompton's is another site because it's an auction house you'll, or Brampton's you'll have to register most likely, but you can get an idea. You find on eBay a violin and they'll say labeled. Chances are again if it's not a Stradivari or one of the really big names Chances are it's an actual instrument. You can get a judge of what they have sold for in auctions. Terizio is nice because it goes, well, it was uh, sold by this auction house or this auction house. 
you get the idea. Now you get a, an instrument on eBay. Let's say they say, no matter who it's made by, it was made in 1798 or 1802. You can actually tell if that instrument is that old by looking at the photo of this area right in here. Because prior to, and it ranged, they were still made over a period of years. But if it's before 1820, when you look at this side shot very carefully, you're going to see the neck and then you're going to see a joint right here. Was the original peg head, peg box, it's a violin, not a guitar, was the original peg box grafted onto another neck? That is not a bad thing. That is a very good thing. Because prior to that time, violins were Baroque. They were Baroque violins, which means they had a shorter neck and a lower string angle. So after seven or 1820 or there and abouts, depends on the maker. Because again, Baroque instruments were made over a period of years. That neck was removed and a modern one was put on. So if you see this joint, and it'll come kind of straight down and across the heel there, that's a very old violin. Now, you're going to find a range of instruments from ones that are player ready with new strings, and you can also kind of judge, is this a good violin? How is it from a good seller? Did they put good strings on it? You can go to string silk color charts and you can actually figure out what kind of strings those are and then for the heck of it take those strings violin strings if it's like a diodario pro art or a infield um, vision or something like that how much do they cost did they take the time to put a ten dollar set of strings on their violin or did they put a seventy dollar or more set of strings on it that can kind of be a judge these are clues you're sleuthing here you want to get a really nice old violin, an old one, which I like. That's why I just, um, on eBay, I purchased a French violin made in roughly about 1850. Because this fellow, Cesar, didn't date his instruments, but I know that he was born in 1801 and died in 1875, or 1808, I forget. But he died in 1875. They were undated, so I'm kind of judging from the 1850s there and abouts, plus or minus, maybe 1845, maybe 1860, yeah, I don't know. But that mid-1800s French violin. It is currently at a violin maker shop because it needs some work. It needs some work. Um, and then I also have one that's arriving. The last I checked, it's in Nevada heading towards me. Beautiful, 1906. I mean, this is in pristine shape. And you can ask the person selling it, is it the original varnish? And if it's the original varnish and it's in pristine sh shape, that's a good sign. Somebody loved that instrument and they took care of it. It's probably a good one. The thing is, over 100 years old, in pristine shape, in this cellar. I also check, is it an antique shop, which I bought. The French violin just from an antique shop, so he couldn't answer questions. But the German one bought it from a, a seller in California. All he sells is violins and high quality ones. And so I've got some some confidence when I asked him, is that violin original varnish and in pristine shape? That's a good sign. Again, somebody took care of that, loved it, and you know was careful with it for well over 100 years. It's a good sign. Now, your big bargains might come with a violin that doesn't have the bridge, doesn't have the sound post in, probably doesn't have the sound post in. They're not glued in. That's it. Let's see if you can see it in there. Yep, you can see it. Might not have the pegs in it might not have the, the tail piece or the chin rest. Those are details that can be added um, by a violin maker. Don't take your violins, don't take your violins, even though you might have a music store that says they do repair work locally, 
if you see, and this is not a slam against electric guitars, electric guitars in the windows, that's not a place to take a fine violin. Send it, carefully pack it, send it to a violin maker because they will use hide glue and not tight bond. And they know how to set the sound post. They know how to carve bridges. They know how to do a proper job on fitting the pegs. Spend the extra dollars for good work at a violin maker. Not just a luthier. You want a violin maker. It's worth it. You know, if you have a good violin. A note, and there's a YouTube channel that's, I use tight bond glue. Why not? It's good glue. Well, you know, there's all these little, little things you have to be consistent with. Maybe it's all right to use tight bond on the plate, the top, in the back. Maybe. I wouldn't go to a place that uses tight bond whatsoever, but, you know, whatever. You have to have high glue along the seams because this room has a 45% relative humidity. Where I keep my instruments, it's right at 55. You might live in a dry area. It might, your room might be 30% or less. Well, what happens is these plates will shrink when they dry out. And hide glue will allow the plate to separate from the ribs, preventing cracking. I would rather have the instance of gluing the plate back onto the ribs than having a crack form in the surface. Now, cracks are not a death warrant for instruments. If they're on this side, the base side, eh, it could be vis a visual problem. But if you have one right through where that post is, that's bad. That's bad. It can be repaired, but it's bad. Shopping eBay. You look at it. You can get a pristine instrument, brand new strings, and you know what strings they are. But you might save a little bit if it needs to have the glue joint fixed up. That is not a... That's not a difficult repair. In fact, if you were bold, you could do that yourself because you don't need to potentially pop the whole top off and re-glue the whole thing. Using hide glue, a person can do that on their own. Not tight bond liquid hide glue that comes in a tube and you just squeeze it out, but actual real hot hide glue. But again, if you were to send that off to a repair person and say, Use high glue, not tight bond. And they say, well, all I use is high glue, hot high glue, traditional hot high glue. That's a cheap and easy fix. They literally just brush some glue in there, pinch it together with their clamps, and then wipe it off. You don't have to do extensive work. That's not bad. Shopping for instruments, you see one that they'll, they will say, no cracks on the top and the back or the plates, no cracks, just seam separations. Why not? Now as far as the price, how much does it cost to get new pegs fitted? How much does it cost to glue this down? How much does it cost to do all the minor work, set, making a new bridge, setting the sound post, all this stuff? You can just go to the, the interwebs, type in in your search, Priceless for violin repairs. It's general, but it'll give you some idea. You know, you bought that that gem made in 1832. You researched the maker. That's a real maker. Probably actual real label here. You know, um, gonna get it for four hundred dollars. You discovered that their violins generally sell for. Eight thousand to ten thousand dollars. That's a good deal. You can absorb some cost figuring out how much does it cost to fit a new bridge properly. Again, violin maker, not an instrument store with repair services. Sound post, pegs, um, putting a new tailpiece on, blah blah blah. You can figure out how much you're going to have to spend considering because if you've got cracks, it's a variable. You might have to re. It, it touch up a little bit, you know, the varnish here and there. That's not a killer amount of money. Now, the French violin I have, there was edge damage on this side. The edges are these things right here. And 
that's where it's handy to have a violin maker because that, that's an easy fix for them. They just flatten it off, add new wood, recarve it, touch up the varnish. And they'll also talk to you about, do you want it to look factory new with complete new varnish or do you just want, you want to keep the character but just, you know, protect it? On the French violin, I've got an area where the, the varnish chipped off and I like that because it looks old, but having that bare wood, not good for the instrument. So I need to have somebody that is good with varnish, instrument maker. Um, the last little bit, I was going to say something else. Hang with me for a second while I remember. Mm, I would personally shy away, oh that's it, factories. Now in Italy, there's Italy, France, Germany are the big ones. There were also instrument makers in in uh, Austria and Belgium and just all over the place, but let's just consider Italy, France, and Germany for, for a little bit. In Italy, there were very few factories where they would license out their name and the factories would build violins along with the original maker that has his label in there. In France, there were a few more little factories, but they were more shops and factories. They took pride in, in what they did. Miracord in Paris were big makers. In Germany, there was a lot of factory action with violins. Um, Saxony violins. Chances are it's factory. If you see an Antonio Stradivari label, it's probably fake. Factory. You have no idea really where it was made. You just know maybe in the early 1900s it was made in Germany. Chances are. Unknown maker. Maybe good, maybe not good. If it doesn't have any label whatsoever, taking your chances. I'm a label reader. Um, and again, there's some makers that made their bench made, which means they were made at a bench by a single person or a family. And then there were also um, factories that just cranked them out by the hundreds of thousands. Czechoslovakia wasn't Czechoslovakia in the beginning of the 1900s, but that region produced some fine instruments, but there was also factories, so be careful of that. And doing some research on the internet, you can locate a na name such as uh, Richard Garris, for example, or in France, let's say Dominique Salzard. Some of them were real, made by Salzard and Garris, some of them were factories, so you have to be careful. You have to look at the clues. One nice clue when you're looking at early violins like this, and two piece back, bookmarked, or bookmatched. One piece, one piece. A lot of the earlier instruments made by the actual person and not in the factories were one piece. They're just clues. Anyway, that should get you started. Uh, some things to think about. Sometimes people don't care where the instrument was made, but this video was made for the people that wanted to know the story behind their violin. Would I ever be able to find out the master that oversaw the production of this? Probably not. You know, it's a beautiful violin made in a Chinese workshop, but it's anonymous. All it is is a beautiful instrument. Me, I'm not gonna, I don't want to sell this violin. It's a really good one, but in the case of the French one I bought and the German one, kind of German, it was actually made across the border. Again, borders changed in the Czechoslovakian current countryside, Richard Garris. I'd like to know the stories. I would like to know, which I can find out, who did they learn from? Who were their apprentices? It's a violin with a pedigree. That's all I've got to say. Good luck. Happy hunting.